Achtung, Achtung. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. On Monday, James and I recorded a podcast about Operation Barbarossa, and we went on so long chewing this particular bone, we decided the best thing to do was split it across two days. So, in this second part of the conversation, we start by speaking about the mixture of hubris and fear that stopped Hitler's lackeys from sounding the alarm on potential failures. You know, ju just as it's a strategic earthquake in 1940 for the Allies, um, what the Germans achieve, it, quite clearly, they're all pretty pleased with how they did the summer before, aren't they? They're all thinking, we're brilliant at this. Because after all, there were naysayers and there were people before... You know, you don't want to be that guy, do you? It, yeah. From the spring of 1940 going, ah, this isn't going to work. And then you look like you look like a jackass, don't you? So you don't yeah. want to... That, is that what's driving it? Is that part of what's driving it? Is that why Thomas is persuaded to change his report? Because he does... When the victory parade goes through Moscow that autumn, as predicted, because after all, the Russians are rubbish and they're Slavs and they're barbarians and all those sort of things, and, and they're corrupt and, and their tanks are crap and... Their army's been purged. There's no one any good. And, the, you know, blah, 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 blah. All those things. You don't want to be the guy at the victory parade in Moscow who went, well, I didn't think this was going to happen. Do you? Is that what's driving it? Or do they all believe in the will? Or are they... I don't know. I don't know. Because that, that must be... A... I think they've all got a bit hubristic. I think, they, I think they've started to believe their yeah. own hype, haven't they? I mean, you know, they, they, they've done the French. And as you say, that's a strategic earthquake. You'd expect them to be... The Yugoslavians, you'd expect them to beat yeah. the Greeks and all sorts of cock-ups making sure that Crete doesn't go yeah. in favour of the British either. But but that doesn't, you know, but, but, but winning in Yugoslavia and winning in, in Greece and all the rest of it, that, that, that doesn't sort of say genius military machine. That just says we've got more and yeah. we're better. It's not quite the same thing and you'd expect them to. So it's, so it's a kind of, sort of quite a poor indicator. But I think they're all starting to believe their own hype and everything. But the consequence of... The, of I, mean, I mean, but they... There are warnings because, you know, they've all underestimated yep. the RAF in, in the yep. Battle of Britain. You know, they've, they've, they haven't really thought that one through. Um, they've underestimated the intelligence. They've underestimated Britain's capacity yep. for producing aircraft. Um, they've underestimated the air yep. defence system, etc., etc., etc. So there is form on hubristically going for something, <laughs> overconfident, and, and then yeah. being caught short. And the warnings from that don't seem to apply to Barbarossa. And one of the reasons, I think, is also because I don't think there's much joined-up thinking between the yeah. armed services. But another one is, is just because Hitler's already decided. It's, yeah, it's yeah. a fait accompli. You know, it's, it's, you know, he's been thinking about this since August 1940. So, so it's, it's kind of gathered a momentum whereby... What's the alternative? I mean, it's very interesting when you read, read memoirs of, of, of Field Marshal Balka. Balka's a... He's the 1st Infantry Regiment... Um, commander in 1940. It's his yeah. men who cross the, the River Merza, Sedan. And by the end of the war, he's a field marshal and he's a brilliant um, panzer yeah. commander. And he is not in the first wave at Barbarossa and very disappointed. And he's actually attached to, I think, to, to Von Schell's right. motor pool. So he spends an awful lot of time going to the front. And in the build up to, and he's a he's an intelligent guy, thoughtful guy, and he analyzes the chances in the Soviet Union and what he thinks the alternatives are. And basically he concludes that, that it is right to go to into the Soviet Union because the alternative is yeah. to sue for peace. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's not going to happen yeah. because you've still got an aggressive yeah. Britain and America waiting in the sides and, you know, you've got the Soviet Union and the same old problems that Germany mm. always has of being penned mm. in in the middle of Europe. They're now in this situation where they, that, you know, suing for peace is yeah. just not an option. Because of the threat of the westward spread yeah. of communism, because of, you know, everything. So he says, I think, you know, I think it's the right decision to go in, but we need to be really, you know, have our eyes wide open and all this kind of stuff. And I, I think at the highest level, there is a kind of sort of, what else can we do? And we're going to win. It's the thing, it's the thing that's on the end of all of the sort of discussions, isn't it? Anyway, we're going to win. You know, it, there's that fascinating thing that Paulus runs the war game um, at the end of 1940, looking at, looking at how... You how you attack the Soviet Union and it doesn't go very well. The war game, it, it, they get you know it, the, the the sort of rough plan gets stuck. But Paulus goes, ah, well, we're going to win anyway. Doesn't doesn't really matter because we've got the will to do this. We're tougher than them and all that sort of stuff. And I think that's what's going on. Even and he's supposedly he's you know and I think that's really interesting to to, to find him in the story of the Second World War long before he becomes Paulus of Stalingrad. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, he's a exactly. Yeah, isn't he? And he's. I mean, Paris is a guy who's go, who, who gets sent to North Africa to tell Rommel to yeah. wind his neck. Yeah. In. Yeah. So he's completely trusted. So he's. You know, he's he's obviously someone who uh, Hitler has great confidence in. So this idea that later on that oh, how much of a Nazi, Nazi was Paulus? Well, I don't know. You t- you you tell me. Look at the other stuff he got up to. But I think that, that you do have this is really really interesting that 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 like you say, Hitler's decided uh, Hitler's decided it's going to be a fait accompli. So everyone's kind of kind of like. Not only has he decided on this, but we're going to win. We're going to win. You know, Halder getting into an argument with Hitler about whether to go to Moscow or not, and in the end thinking, oh, it doesn't matter. We're going to win. It'll all come out in the wash. Does it really matter who makes what decision? Because we're going to do this, and the Russians will collapse. Yeah, so we so we should explain that, that basically they're, they're, they're attacking Barbarossa on yeah. these three fronts. There's a southern front, yeah. central front, northern front. And and the, the, the as per 1914 going into France... The main driving force of the victories in France is, is the, yeah. are the Panzer divisions. You know the, these motorized, these sixteen motorized yeah. um, divisions out of one hundred and thirty-five. In the case of yeah. May nineteen forty, of which ten are in Army Group A, which is the one that's going south mm-hmm. through the Ardennes and doing the encirclement behind the backs of the Allies. And it's exactly the same with the same yeah. principle with, um, with with Barbarossa that you have these three panzer groups one two and three which, which have the bulk of the armor I think there's seventeen panzer divisions by by Barbarossa so it's not a lot you know and they're expected to do that all the yards, um, and so it's all all seems to be going okay they've sort of you know they've taken sort of Minsk and and they've they've sort of swarmed in and they've they've taken Smolensk which is a sort of Russian big important Russian city which is about you know. 250 miles from Moscow, due kind of west of Moscow, um, by the uh, by the 15th of July, and it's all looking you know it's all looking fine. But but at this point on the 17th of July, Hitler changes and, and issues War Directive Number 33, which is this this actually I don't want you to go into Mo- Moscow anymore. I want um I want one Panzer group to go you know a couple of Panzer groups two and three to go and support um two and one rather to go and support a drive into Ukraine the breadbasket the you know with all these resources and all the rest of it and I want another one to go up towards Leningrad and the, the you know Leningrad's going to be taken um and we're going to take Ukraine and then we'll you know we'll deal with Moscow later and so the problem is of course is that's all well and good but but it means you're not then driving on Moscow um, which is the sort of you know the psychological heart of, yep. of the Soviet Union, um, as well as the actual yep. capital. And the other problem is the time it takes to transfer those troops. It's not it's not quite so easy yep. just clicking your fingers right and go okay yep. let's move move second Panzer Group down to the south. It it, it it's a huge ball yep. ache logistically. And the problem is is they've underestimated the ability of the of the Red Army, and they've underestimated the logistical challenges of operating in the Soviet Union with the shortcomings that they've already got in terms of vast numbers of different vehicles and all the rest of it. And and I suppose to go back to the original point about this, about logistics in the, in, in the Second World War, is, is that if you don't take enough care of your logistics and your support networks, you're yeah. going to come a cropper. I mean, it, it, it will come back and hit you in the face. And that is exactly what happens, but but it happens much quicker. The maps of the Soviet uh, the campaign in the east yeah. would suggest, you know, you've still got these sort of huge encirclements yeah. going on with the encirclement yeah. of Kiev and stuff in 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 se- middle of September, um, nineteen forty one, and it still looks like it's one way traffic, but it absolutely isn't yeah. one way traffic, because. By this point, the Germans are kind of, you know, as it's been repeated in many phrases, winning themselves yeah. to death. Uh, and, and I've got to say, I, I find the whole thesis of David Stahl incredibly yeah. convincing. I mean, I just, you know, and if you look in the back, all his, all his, his, it, this is all based on primary research. So he's just spent an absolute ton of time down at the military archives in Freiburg in the Black Forest, in the Schwarzwald. And looking at after action reports and looking at meetings and minutes and all the rest of it, it's all original first hand documents. It's not it's not hearsay, it's not it's not being wise after the event. He's looking at it in real time. And that's what makes it so brilliant. I mean this stuff about the stuff about Halder de- deceiving Hitler about the thrust to, to Moscow is re- is really, really fascinating. The army obviously think what we need to do 
is is we got to go to we got to go to Moscow. That's how you win this because they're they're thinking they're thinking that that's your military political blow is to just take out the capital. Right. Hitler disagrees. And Paulus, after the war, writes in the army headquarters plan, the capture of Moscow was regarded as the principal objective. Its capture, however, was to be preceded by the capture of Leningrad, the fall of which would deprive the Baltic fleet of its main use. The Russian war effort of the main art of the armament production of the city and above all, the Russian army of a strategic assembly area for a counteroffensive against the flank and rear of the German forces advancing on Moscow. For this last reason, it was essential that Leningrad should be the first objective. So... Which is it? Exactly. He says, what Paulus neglects to mention, of course, is that the army simply had no other choice but to accept the precedence of Leningrad over Moscow. And that left to its own devices, it seems highly unlikely the army of subordinated army groups sent us mobile forces to its northern counterpart. So basically, they they haven't made actually made a decision. Held has made a decision for himself. Hitler's got his own idea of what they should do. And in the planning, they haven't settled that. So later on, when, as you say, Hitler goes, right, we're, we're, we're changing direction... It's it's in the face of a load of people who have thought that that's a terrible idea. And and so, of course, it's good. So it's so everyone's dragging their heels for that decision as well. It's just it's so interesting, this idea that in a plan that you plan anyway, with the flaws built into the, you know, without that agreement, which means there will be a, a fight later on about it. It's that thing. You know, when you're navig- navigating a course, if you start the course three degrees out, it's all very well to start with. You're both heading in the, roughly the same direction, but give it time later, you're miles apart. Do you see what I mean? Completely. And, and the other the other problem you have is that that if you're putting so much emphasis on will and just it will happen because I've said it's going to happen, then what you tend to do is when your when your lines of communications, your logistical chain starts to get stretched, what you focus on is fuel and ammunition. And you start to ignore the needs of the men. Uh, and the, the problem with Barbarossa is that so much emphasis on the German way of war is placed on those spearheads. That it is the spearheads who are losing the most amount of men and losing the most amount of material. And the most of which is expected. And if you don't look after those guys, you're not going to have your spearhead for much longer. Uh, and and it's really interesting because Jonathan Ware then put me on to... 21st Army Group Ordnance, the history of the campaign, which was a kind of, sort of semi-official in-house. And it's all about base depots and it's all about field, field park units. And it's all about, you know, when you'll be coming in and, and, and how far behind the front line and working out beforehand what the absolutely to a T, what what fuel, ammunition, food um, requirements are. In, in the first few days of D-Day and then beyond, and then, you know, all the way through to 1945 and all the rest of it. But there is some really, really interesting stuff in here. And there is a section, and this is still in the kind of Normandy bit, and it says, It should not be thought that in these days of furious battle, all the excitement and urgency centred alone on warlike stores. On the contrary, exclamation mark, when the tide of war sways to and fro, much depends on morale. All things being equal, the side with the best morale wins. Morale has often decided victory in battle. It is that intangible something which every commander seeks, whose value no commander will decry. An ordnance has a big part to play in the making of it. Yeah. So this is this yeah. is really, really yeah. good. I love this bit. If the soldier has not got a great coat to protect him from the cold, or a toothbrush to clean his teeth, if his boots want replacing, if he needs a change of underclothes or socks, if he has not the soap with which to wash himself, lacking these things, a soldier's morale suffers, however good is the supply of ammunition and warlike stores. That's why, from the very beginning of the campaign, the urgent supply of non-fighting and, to some extent, superficially non-essential stores was considered every bit as important as the flow of gun barrels, signal spares and motor transport. Clothing and necessaries were needed in immense quantities to maintain morale at a high pitch, and to the credit of the Royal Army Ordnance Corps, morale did not suffer. So the most important, it says, says, in point of fact, the first two shortages, which were the subject of urgent demands from the theatre, were not, as might have been expected, guns, ammunition, tanks, or any of the thousands of other warlike stores. They were for cotton, drawers and toothbrushes. Blimey. And, and you know, I was reading that and you can't help thinking, you know, that whole thing. You know, if you, if you can... 
of, of what's going on now, you know, wh one side is learning those lessons and has learnt those lessons and one hasn't. It's just so interesting, isn't it? And But the point is, in 1941, the Germans don't put enough care on great coats, underpants and toothbrushes. I mean, I remember reading a book by John Slesser, who was, do you remember, he was the deputy Allied Air Commander yeah. in Italy um, in the latter part of the war, Air, Air Chief Marshal Sir John Slesser. And he writes in his diary, he says, the frustrating thing is the German can survive oh, for yeah. kind of four days, you know, uh, uh, on the kind of rations that our, our allied, yeah, our yeah, namby-pamby yeah. allied troops would expect in one. You know, they don't need end of supplies of cigarettes and Coca-Cola and all the rest of it. And you're thinking, you know what, you're so wrong, mate. They absolutely do. They're just not getting it because they're in a totalitarian regime where they don't have any choice in the matter. But... You know, and also try supplying your men the way the Germans do, and see how how well you do. You know, I mean, you you look at you look at right. There are wobbles in morale in the Normandy campaign, and you know they they know this because they're looking at the they're looking at the letters, the censors are looking at the letters. They you know, and officers are reporting on how the men are doing, and when they need it, suddenly there's beer in the rear areas and and showers and, and naffy and, vans and, and uh, yeah, right, exactly. Well, everything we've everything we've talked about. Um, with, with regards to the planning, planning of Barbara and then Barbaros and then its execution, is people who aren't being realistic about stuff, and who are, like you say, talking about the will. You, if you're worried about the will, you're not going to you're not going to supply toothbrushes. And when people say, "Oh, they didn't have the winter kit," well, no, because because they thought they were going to win. And all of this comes down to we're going to win anyway. We're going to win anyway. Whatever we do, we're going to win anyway. Yeah. Is the is the tag to all of this? And it's almost yeah. like there's a whole, don't you worry your pretty little head about that thing going on. You, you know, that sort of patronising, we're going to win anyway. We haven't aired this yet, but you talked about medicine the other day, which yeah, is fascinating. fascinating. And, you know, and all you have to do is look at, compare the gangrene rates between the German army and the, and the, uh, the British army. Yeah, that was amazing. So 30% in, the, in, German, in German troops compared to, I think, yeah, yeah. Like 1.5 well, yes, or that, in Because that, in wind, you know, um, the, the Windy Gale book I've got, the account of the um, Six Airborne in Normandy, he puts in the back of the book, yeah. there's an appendix, which is, which is injury stats. And, ga and gas gangrene, you know, it's one one point five percent or something. He puts that in, which is, a, I think, yeah. a really interesting thing to put in. You know, and that, that book's from nineteen forty six. So he's saying, here's how we dealt with our wounded. Here's what actually happened to our guys, which is re obviously mattered to him enormously in a way that all the stuff we're talking about. Shut up! Shut up about the fact this isn't economically possible. So you do not care about your soldiers. We just need to take a quick break. We'll see you in a tick. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. As we know with with Barbarossa, you know, but but you know the first the first cool winds are starting to kind of sort of drift over the battlefront in in the kind of yep. third week of August, third fourth week of August, and Halder starts making some comments. I start start sort of putting the feelers out. Oh, we might need some kind of winter kit, mightn't we? And, and, and you know, by the kind of the first week of September, it started to rain a bit, and it started to get really cold at night. You know, and it's been so piping hot in July and early part of August in on in the Soviet Union, and suddenly it isn't, uh, and no one's no one's done the work. You know, it's just, no one's done the preparations. Which brings me to one of the great one of the one of the great um, one of the great things about Barbarossa that gets said is if they'd not gone into if they'd not gone into um, uh, the Balkans when they did, they're delayed by the, the the great. They're delayed by six weeks, and had they not been delayed by six weeks then they, Barbarossa would have been a triumph because they'd have beaten the cold weather. What we're saying here is that's not the case, is that things are so badly organised and also they are biting off so much more than they can chew by going into Russia, into the Soviet Union rather, that that, that six weeks is immaterial to 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 the result. Because people do say that. You do, you'll read that, you'll read that, you know, when we talked, when we've talked about Barbarossa before, you get immediately someone on Twitter go, "Yeah, but you know, it's the six week delay. Had they gone up on, had they gone up on time when they wanted to in in May, they'd have won, and the war would have turned out differently." It's all because of the Balkans, and I, I just think, at, the more we talk about this, the more that style is basically saying no to that. Yeah, and also, also, 
they needed to sort out the Balkans because otherwise the Allies would have got to got to Romania. So, that, so, so you know, but Mussolini is somehow restrained from ever ever setting that sort of set of dominoes in motion. But 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 you know, and, and Hitler is somehow or Hitler decides not to help intervene. No, I I, I agree. With you. I agree with the, the basic point you're making and that David Sall is making that 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 the the whole point about this. You know what we talk about today is logistics, and the problem is, is if you don't look after your logistics change, if you don't plan properly, if you if you haven't done the prep, if you haven't dotted those i's and crossed those t's, you're going to come, you're going to sh- fall short. Your 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 the weaknesses um, are going to undermine your strengths to to a point where you can't really continue. And absolutely, when when you're one of your three absolute number one spearhead driving forces of your of your invasion is reduced by 71 (laughs) percent you know by within five and a half weeks of the start you've got a big problem on your hands and and that's that wouldn't have changed well that's had you started six weeks earlier because that six week period is that six week period it doesn't matter when it happens um, yeah, exactly. And attrition. And because right. this, this is the thing, because I've always felt that's too neat. I've always thought, yeah, but Russia remain, you know, the Soviet Union remains enormous. The Soviet Union remains a, a, a state that has extraordinary resources actually at its disposal. The great big population, a government, a government that so far in its history has stopped at nothing to to survive. So much of what's going on in the Soviet Union is the, is the Bolshevik system doing everything it can to survive and stay in place as much as anything else. Yes, it's revolution, revolutionized society, but it's also making damn sure it can't be displaced. So the idea that six weeks of spring weather add a spring to German step, it's got to also add something to the Russians' ability to respond. But if it means that, as well that the Germans are hit by the Rapistista six weeks later in a different way... You know, I don't think it's enough of a lever to pull the timing to change the outcome in the sort of what in the what if spectrum. Yeah. But it's a thing people always it's a thing no, people I always come back you. to, and I've, I always thought I just don't, I just don't know about that because there's there's the argument that had they not deployed those forces, they'd have been available to them for for Barbarossa. But even then, as we've discussed, deploying these forces is extremely complicated because they've got themselves in this sort of cat's cradle of supply and procurement. And uh, uh, and all that sort of thing. I mean, and and like you say, we're seeing how difficult it is right now, even when you've got kit that matches. Yeah, uh, the po- the point to really really stress with Barbarossa is that what you're looking at is is you know people sort of go oh you know there were sort of whatever it was millions of men you know hundred thousand vehicles whatever more than hundred thousand you know million vehicles whatever it was you know the vast sort of a, 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 a the vast um, scale of the German invasion. Okay, w- w- what one has to understand is is the proportions of that, and it has to be appreciated that the spearhead really is the driving kinetic point of the spear. That that that's that's what's doing all the hard yards. But of course, that's also so. Therefore, they're going the furthest. They're seeing the most action. They're being attrited the most. So although they're the best trained and best equipped, they're also the ones that are suffering the most. And so we get seduced by figures, you know, a million strong army, you know, a thousand tanks or whatever it is. But but how many of those tanks are fit for purpose? You know, in the case of 1941, how many are Panzer Mark IVs and Panzer Part Threes? Not that many, even then. You know, how how many how many of those, you know, 3.6 million troops or whatever it is I can't quite remember off the top of my head you know how many of those millions of troops are actually fully trained 18 to 27 um frontline spearhead troops a pretty small proportion you know so so you have to kind of sort of think of it in those terms and you you have to realize that, that for a place that's as big as the Soviet Union it's not that's not enough it's it's not enough to do what you need to do, particularly when your logistical challenges are so enormous. You haven't got enough rolling stock. You know the railway gauge in Soviet Union is different. So if you want to use their railway system, you've got to you've got to change the sale of the tracks. You know one of the big problems was they didn't think they'd have to do that because they think they'd just capture lots of locomotives. Well, that didn't happen because as the Soviet Union, you know, as the Red Army retreated, they blew them all up. So they destroyed everything. So. That's a pre-war assumption that hasn't been fulfilled. So, okay, so that's a problem, isn't it? 
you know so so these logistical challenges just start to mount and mount and mount and then as you do get into the autumn it starts getting cold and you haven't looked after your men enough and you're not looking after your men enough even in the height of summer you're not even by the 29th of july because these guys are exhausted they need rotating out but you can't rotate them out because there aren't enough you know so you're losing 60 60 percent but you're being replaced with 10 percent so your net loss is 50 percent and that's not enough to do what you want because the more you battle forward, the harder the whole process becomes because your logistic lines of communication are longer. So it's not only that you're, you're, you're physically weakened and reduced in your capacity, you're also reduced in capacity because your logistic change is being challenged harder. You see, it's interesting this though, Jim, because whenever we talk about Northwest Europe, that, that, you know, and, uh, and what happens is, is we talk about logistics all the time. Uh, the, the, it's the consider it's the principal consideration for basically your broad front versus your narrow thrust you know uh, and these are decisions born of logistic situations as well and that quite clearly that's the thing everyone's talking about and that's dominating planning yeah here we're talking about a plan where they have to, they just haven't they haven't let the dot they haven't let it dominate the planning and and it's bitten bitten them bitten them thoroughly on the arse i mean it and yet this isn't how discussion of barbarossa tends to tends to go it tends to be the great encirclements it tends to be that the, you know because it is it is on the face of it a staggering blitzkrieg achievement they they capture all these millions of uh, of soviet soldiers the soviets fold you know um to start with and don't offer enough don't seem to enough offer enough friction so it's quite interesting well, that... but only in those those very very first weeks that's the interesting thing i mean uh, um, um, what you see those battles of army group center i mean it's it's you know, Battle of Smolensk goes on till something like the 8th of September, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and that includes major Soviet counterattacks. You know, yeah, yeah. They don't achieve what they want to achieve, but they're constantly grinding down yeah. the Germans and their ability. Yeah. And, and as, we, as we said, you know, it is the Germans on the front line that are facing the hardest tasks. And, and they may be the best troops, but they're also the troops that are getting hammered the most because yeah, yeah. they're in the front line all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and we've underestimated that, and and it's all very well going man for man, you know, German troops are better. But what what do you mean by that? I mean, you know, yeah. if, you, if you're talking about man for man, talk about it in the whole. You know, talk yeah. about support troops, talk about backup troops, talk about troops at medicine. The, you know general staff level, talk about medicine. You know, yeah. man for man, clearly the German army is not better than Allied troops, for example. You know, because yeah. they don't have that support network. Yeah. You know, they might have had some dazzling victories at the beginning of the war, but then they're on the back foot. So they can't be, can they? Yeah. You know, and, and they've got so many shortcomings and, and all these other factors. It, it's not I suppose what, what we're trying to say, really, is, is that when one is looking at battle, when one's looking at war, it's not just about who's got the best machine gun and who's the most dogged in their, their attacks and their ability to kind of, you know, get themselves into kind of interesting battle groups. That's not what you should be judging people on uh, and judging the capabilities of armies on. You should be judging them really about their supply system and about how they manage themselves and how they organise their war. Yeah. Uh, and obviously in the Blitzkrieg, the organisation of the German army is absolutely superb. It's incredibly yeah. good. It's for, yeah. you know, But by the time it gets to Barbarossa, a massive sea change has happened. And that's yeah. because of the hubris of Hitler, because they've actually got themselves into a corner that they can't really get out of. You know, the only solution yeah. is, is soon for peace, which is totally unconscionable. So that's not going to happen. Yeah. So you've got to make a fist of it. And the fist of it is to just ignore the shortcomings. Yeah. Believe in your own hype, believe in will, yeah. and somehow hope that you're kind of, you know, because you're up against inter, uh, uh, Untermension, that's going to kind of cut it. And, yeah. it. and it just doesn't. And this is, a, and, and as, a, as a sanitary warning from the kind of annals of history, underestimating your enemy and not doing enough prep and not having decent logistics should be a warning for everybody who wants to go and invade a country and thinks they can roll them over. Yeah. Well, as he puts it, the only planning stages of Barbarossa reveal a muddled process where information was produced to match major decisions already taken rather than information being gathered on which to base major decisions. Such intellectual bankruptcy speaks strongly of the decline in excellence within the German general staff and the ease with which events were allowed to overshadow judgment and reason. Yep, and and I would say that applies to the invasion of Ukraine as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfectly, in fact. Yeah. I mean, regardless of what happens in the days and weeks pa to come. Paradigmatic, yeah. 
yeah. You know. Anyway, um, we've 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 talked for a long time. Um, we will see you all soon. Thanks very much for listening. Bye for now. Cheerio.